let me let me introduce our speaker for today. Please help me welcome Cecilia Sanders, PhD candidate in Caltech's Division of Geological and Planetary Sciences. Cecilia received a bachelor's degree <clears throat> in Earth and Planetary Science and Astrophysics from Harvard. In 2018, she earned a master's of science degree in planetary science from Caltech. Currently, Cecilia holds a National Science Foundation Graduate Research Fellowship, and she is recipient of a 2020 award from Caltech for her contributions to educational outreach. Cecilia Sanders asks how living things impact the world around them in ways that are preserved and ways that leave evidence in rock. It is an important question, she has argued, because seen over long periods of time, such evidence reveals the story of the evolution of life and perhaps of its origins. She has studied sedimentology and stratigraphy, I almost got both of those wrong, in Precambrian rocks in Brazil, Namibia, and the Southwestern US. When not in the lab, she develops elementary level science curricula to the local school district. In addition to this, she is a gifted illustrator. Cecilia is also a committed activist for racial justice. Cecilia Sanders, thank you for being here today. Thank you for taking the time to speak with us. We'll take, yes, we'll take questions uh, at the end. And for the moment, I'll ask everyone to turn off their microphones. With that, Cecilia, let me turn the floor over to you. Awesome, thanks so much, Steve. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, super excited to be here. I, uh, I was telling Steve uh, and some of the other uh, early uh, arrivals how Palomar Observatory is the first place that I visited when I first came to California to study. Uh, it's a very special place to me. Uh, its architecture, its history, its uh, continuing role in the exploration of the universe. So it's an honor to be here. All right, I am going to go ahead and try to share my screen. Inevitably, that is, you know, this is this is where the technical problems will happen if they're going to happen. All right, let's see. All right, someone could give me a thumbs up if you can see my screen. Awesome, amazing, beautiful, beautiful. Okay, so now, there we go, okay. So I think, uh, so it's difficult, a little difficult for me to access the chat while I'm doing this. So, uh, uh, but I think questions will be at the end. Uh, and so I'll stop sharing my screen then and then can pull up the chat. That's how we'll do this. All right, so first things first, hello everyone. As Steve said, I'm Cecilia. Um, I am a PhD candidate in geobiology uh, and I've been at Caltech for just about five years now. And in that time, my research has taken me to a lot of very different uh, places to study a very wide range of things. But ultimately my work has always been about understanding how living things enter the geologic record of a planet or a world, and then using that information to understand what the geologic record can and can't tell us about the world that those things lived in. So it's this puzzle that we're trying to unravel. Now, 
this puts me mostly on the geo side of geobiology. So the, the places that I visit in the course of my research are places where there are old rocks exposed at the surface of the planet that might record the history of Precambrian Earth's oceans. So Precambrian Earth as in pre about 520, 530 million years ago. Um, so really the bulk of Earth history and we'll get back to that timeline and uh, the significance of that. But I mostly study Precambrian Earth. Uh, and to do that, I observe the rocks in their regional context and collect samples that can be analyzed for their composition and their microtextures when we take them back to the lab. Uh, so in fact, this is probably the best picture ever taken of me in my life. Um, uh, I'm vain and I like to include it in things. Uh, I was taken by one of my colleagues uh, in Eastern Brazil, um, specifically at Mojo do Pai Inácio in Bahia. Uh, so this is a Northeastern Brazilian state that uh, whose geology forms the bulk of my thesis research now. Uh, so this talk series is usually presented by astrophysicists and cosmologists and the like, but I'm a geologist. Uh, what is my connection to the study of the wider universe? So, my answer to that is like many people, I grew up a fan of fantasy and science fiction. Uh, I liked building worlds and trying to populate them with interesting creatures and things. And this evolved into an interest in the origins and evolution of life in the universe as a whole. Uh, the scientists attempt to answer questions like how did life begin and why does it look the way that it does? Um, can it occur in places other than the earth? And if so, uh, in what ways would it be different than the life that we already know? So my interest in the search for life on other worlds led me to study astrophysics and planetary science during my undergraduate and master's programs. But really earth is the only world to date where we know life exists. So my more speculative work uh, in exobiology, the study of life um, outside or in other places uh, that shifted um, to the study of ancient earth. So in the course of my work, I try to treat ancient earth like an alien planet, uh, another world where we know that the same laws of physics and chemistry apply, but the atmosphere, the surface, the interior, they're all at a different stage in their evolution. So the past is an alien world to us, and it provides the best model we have for the study of alien worlds that exist in the universe today. So interestingly, the search for life in the universe, the search for life on other worlds uses a lot of the same tools and principles as the search for information about life on ancient Earth. So in this photograph, uh, you can see uh, behind me the layered rocks of Mojo de Bayanacio and the plateaus behind it uh, carved into U-shaped valleys uh, in the distance by uh, glaciers that are now no longer there. So the layers in these rocks preserve thousands and thousands of years of sedimentation by rivers, mostly more than 600 million, year, uh, more than 600 million years ago. Uh, so the sizes and shapes of the individual sand grains that make up the layers, the thick, the relative thicknesses of the layers, all of these things tell the story of a past environment, uh, very different from the one that we see when we walk around on top of these plateaus today. And if we were to look inside the finest grained, uh, the finest grained, the best preserved sediments, perhaps some of the mudstones and siltstones uh, in between some of the coarser layers, then we might find chemical and isotopic signatures of various processes and systems. So uh, processes of climate, of microbiology, of paleotopography. This is a photo of what is thought to be a remnant of a river delta deposit or crevasse splay in Jezero Crater on Mars. So if you've been following the exploration of uh, the Martian surface uh, as performed by our newest, our newest rover, Perseverance, uh, then you may have seen this photograph before. Uh, this is a photograph of a remnant called Kodiak. Uh, so it's the, the survivor of uh, several billion years of erosion. And you can see that the layers and their component sediments here are not so different from those on Mojo de Payanacio. Uh, and like those uh, sedimentary layers, uh, in the first photograph, they tell a story 
about the history of that landscape. So perhaps intermittent flooding due to glacial melting or mud stabilized bars in a slow moving braided river. Uh, we don't quite know yet because it's still the subject of active research, but I show you this image in contrast to the uh, image taken in Eastern Brazil, because I think they both emphasize how the reconstruction of paleo environments at the surface of a rocky planet um, is pretty much the same, whether you're on Mars or on Earth. So just like at Mojo de Pianacio, the, the right combination of paleo environment and serendipitous sampling might yield evidence of processes that involved living things uh, and their environment and the interactions between them. So this brings me to the primary subject of this talk, the search for life. So I've used a few words and phrases thus far, uh, buzzwords and terms that appear in a lot of press releases and grant applications for planetary research, uh, astrobiology, exobiology, search for life in the universe, the origins of life. But thus far, we've taken for granted that we as the scientific community really know what these words mean. So life, biology, what we have to define those things and we have to understand what we're looking for, whether we're talking about the ancient earth or ancient Mars or Europa or Enceladus or any number of uh, exoplanets uh, and exomoons uh, whose histories we can imagine if not directly observe yet. When the crew in Europa report one of my favorite science fiction movies, sampled the surface and subsurface of Jupiter's most famous moon. Uh, they had a biologist on board whose uh, stated job was to look for signs of life. So this, it become, if you've seen the movie, uh, uh, if you've seen the movie, then you know that it becomes a bit of a moot point when tentacles burst through the ice to haul her colleagues down into the icy deeps. But, but before that happens, uh, the film doesn't really explain much what their resident astrobiologist is scanning the surface for. Similarly, when the away team in any of the thousands of episodes and iterations of Star Trek, when they wave their tricorders around on a new world that they're visiting saying, no life signs detected, Captain. We, no one ever really explains what those signs are. Uh, as another example, uh, from an astronomy perspective when when I believe it's Jodie Foster uh, is listening to radio emissions over interstellar distances and in the film contact no one no one really explains what what she's looking for exactly so this this seems like a pretty glaring omission uh, in a lot of our a lot of not just our science fiction but our actual uh, our actual development of scientific campaigns uh, and, mission, and missions. We don't always define what we're looking for when we say we're looking for evidence of life. So the question that I want to, if not fully answer, at least try to chip away at today is what in short is life? And specifically, what is life to an astro or geobiologist? Because in order to search for life in the universe and to study its origin and evolution, we have to know what life is, what it looks or sounds or feels like, uh, and then what it looks or sounds and feels like over extravagant lengths of time or at different spatial scales and uh, what the, the statistics are, what, what is the likelihood that it will leave evidence of itself behind when it ends. So the short and somewhat glib answer to those questions is, well, baby, you'll know it when you see it. And there's a lot of different kinds of life as we know it. But we, we as, as people, as humans, we think we're pretty good at distinguishing between what is alive and what isn't. But it's difficult to put our finger on exactly how. So that's what I'm going to elaborate on uh, with the rest of the time that we have today. Uh, going to try to talk through how we define life, uh, how we describe it in its many forms and styles, and then ultimately the, the million dollar question, how do we go about studying it and detecting it on alien worlds, whether that's the alien world of the ancient earth or the alien world of another planet, moon, or asteroid. So we'll start with the building blocks. 
life as we know it requires water and rocks or sediment. And why do we say that? Well, if, you, if you're in a place that doesn't have liquid water and doesn't have rocks to interact with that water, uh, then the water won't be filled with the kinds of charged particles, uh, molecules, uh, molecules and, and, and larger structures that uh, have different sizes and conformations. And, the kinds of, and then the kinds of chemical and physical processes that could occur would be really limited. So water and rocks together are actually really special, uh, chemically speaking. Water is an excellent retainer of energy and its component molecules have a polarity to them that makes them especially good at pulling and pushing on other molecules, contributing to the breakdown of some materials and the reassembly of others. There aren't that many other naturally or spontaneously uh, occurring substances in the universe that can do all of those things. Uh, water is special, uh, but clearly, this picture that we have, uh, a bunch of molecules of various sizes and polarities floating around in a puddle, we don't really recognize that as life. So we have to, there's something else uh, that we need. So it matters to our definition of life, what kinds of molecules are actually floating around in the water. Uh, so these are just some cartoon drawings of what might be called organic molecules. Uh, and as a reminder, organic molecules are just molecules that contain bonds between uh, the elements carbon, hydrogen, and often oxygen. So the size and possible charges of atoms of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen are such that the bonds between them can produce a lot of really complex and intricate structures. So other elements such as nitrogen, sulfur, phosphorus, various metals, uh, these things can be incorporated into the structures, providing additional complexity and a diversity of form. But critically, it is the organic molecules that can form the structures that we find most essential to life. So selectively reactive structures, things that uh, don't just react with whatever else happens to be around them, but require, uh, but will react with only certain other forms and conformations. Uh, other structures essential to life include membranes, globules, frame, structural frames and scaffolding. Uh, and as it turns out, inorganic molecules, uh, though they can develop uh, a certain level of complexity, they don't develop quite the same diversity of form. And this uh, we think is very important uh, to distinguishing the living from the non-living. And so we'll revisit that later, just a moment. But of course, we're not there yet with our definition. Organic molecules uh, floating around in, in water, it still doesn't look quite like life to us. And indeed, uh, Saturn's moon Titan, um, which is the study, uh, which is the uh, subject of much active uh, study currently, Titan is awash in complex organic molecules. But still, if you've ever seen images of the surface of Titan, uh, there's nothing on it that really looks quite alive. There's nothing on it that we would consider to be uh, a living thing yet. And so we have to explain why exactly, what's what's missing on Titan uh, that doesn't make it a, that doesn't make it a living planet. So life as we understand it really has to be enclosed. It has to be separated from the environment somehow. It's a distinct thing, the living from the non-living. Uh, so instead of organic molecules just floating around, reacting with other molecules in this diffuse soup, our defini definition of life says that instead those reactions have to be separated somehow from the reactions going on in their surroundings. And if it's separated by a semi-permeable membrane, then some molecules can move back and forth across the boundary between the internal and the external. And that's really important because that means that the internal conditions can be made, uh, that means that the internal conditions uh, can be made different from the external conditions, that the internal can respond to changes in the external and that the internal can kind of perpetuate a state of disequilibrium. So equilibrium is just what happens when you have a bunch of molecules reacting with whatever else is available, uh, thermodyn that they're thermodynamically and kinetically um, favored to react with. Um, and that just means thermodynamically and kinetically favorable just means uh, 
minimizing the amount of free energy uh, and maximizing the amount of entropy. So reaching a point where there are no reactions left to be done, that won't immediately be reversed. That's equilibria. So disequilibrium means that things are still reacting. Energy is being cycled, changed from one form to another, and, and work is being done. Changes are being made. So organic molecules, just the act of surrounding them by the selectively reactive, selectively permeable membrane can help perpetuate disequilibria. And it's though that separation of the inside from the outside uh, and the perpetuation of this disequilibria, that's what we really recognize as life. Uh, almost, so not quite. A selectively permeable membrane that can perpetuate chemical disequilibria between one space and its surrounding environment. It's still not quite living enough for us. You all are probably sitting there thinking about all of the examples uh, that can sort of break this definition. A burlap sack of sand and pebbles of various sizes uh, also fits that definition. So there's, there's something else kind of essential about life that we haven't talked about yet. It turns out that it matters uh, what kinds of chemical disequilibria are going on. So life as we understand it performs metabolism. Using energy generated in one reaction to perform other reactions that would not otherwise be kinetically or thermodynamically favorable, as we said before. And of course, there's even more than that. Uh, in order for us to recognize something as life, it has to be self-perpetuating. Those disequilibria have to last for a certain period of time, and then they have to be doing the work of continuing themselves. So a living thing keeps itself going using those metabolic reactions, and it, it has to maintain its chemical disequilibrium with its environment or make copies of itself that do the same. That's the definition of a living thing. And of course, we're very familiar with self-perpetuation replication uh, as humans. We do it all the time. Our, our progeny, our children, our, our children, our grandchildren, uh, our ancestors, all of this is, you know, we, we consider that pretty essential to our, our concept of ourselves as uh, living things. So with all of these conditions, now we're starting to approach a pretty solid definition of life um, that would be acceptable to a biologist, a chemist, an astronomer, a definition that's a little more satisfying than you'll know it when you see it. So life as we recognize it requires the complexity and diversity of forms afforded by complex organic molecules, requires separation or distinction from its ambient environment, it requires the ability to maintain its internal conditions and adapt to external conditions or also called homeostasis, uh, it requires the performance of metabolism or the coupling of energy producing to energy consuming uh, constructive chemical reactions. Um, and it requires the habit of self-perpetuation or making more of itself. So that's life. That's it. Seems pretty specific. Seems pretty effective as a definition. Uh, but and as I'm speaking here, you're probably all thinking of a, a long list of things, which we wouldn't necessarily call alive and yet satisfy most or all of the conditions that we've already established. Viruses self-perpetuate, as do RNA molecules, prions, wildfires, but ultimately language has its limitations. Um, a few years ago, I, uh, I audited a course taught by a friend of mine, uh, Mike Wong, and he challenged us to come up with a definition for life as astrobiologists. So accumulating lists of conditions and caveats and exceptions, uh, just like those I, I just stepped through with y'all. But ultimately the most satisfying definition of life that I could actually think of to make was a poem. So I, I wrote for that assignment that life is that which tries. Clouds and crystals may grow and evolve, stars may feed and die, a fire may spread its influence, but life is that which tries to survive, to grow, to learn, to adapt, to teach, and to be remembered in some way when it is gone. And I was pretty satisfied with that for the most part, because at some point, what is life does become more of a philosophical or poetical question than a scientific question, but this is a science talk and we're scientists. So if this is what life is, a trying thing, a thing that maintains homeostasis, metabolizes and self-replicates and all of that, we accept that definition 
we accept that there are exceptions to it, that there are caveats to it. It's imperfect, but I, we have a bit of a working definition for what we're looking for out in the universe. So the next question then is how? How do we look for signs of all of those processes? So if you're an astronomer, looking for life means looking for a world that has evidence uh, at its surface or in its atmosphere uh, that can be observed at astronomical distances, uh, evidence of processes that couldn't happen without life. You're trying to exclude other explanations and uh, include uh, so that you can conclude that, okay, what we're observing here can't be explained without a living thing. So on Earth, for example, there are certain molecules that you wouldn't see coexisting in our atmosphere because otherwise they would react with each other and turn into something else. Uh, you wouldn't see them unless a living thing was replenishing one or both of them rapidly, uh, constantly, and at rates that would outpace atmospheric circulation or geological weathering. Uh, or perhaps even molecules that couldn't exist at all unless you had a living thing performing metabolism that could generate enough energy to put together that complex or inherently unstable structure. So starlight or sunlight, depending on where you're standing, uh, reaches these molecules uh, in our atmosphere. And that light represents a certain level of energy. Some of that energy is imparted to these various molecules, interacts with their structure in such a way that some of it is used up, transformed into other forms of energy, or re-emitted in different directions. Now, an astronomer far away might be able to see the star that the world orbits, even if they can't see the, it themselves. So imagine you're an astronomer on another world looking back at our sun, uh, and maybe you're looking back at it, maybe you're looking at it with a telescope, not unlike Palomar's. Uh, and generally, uh, as an astronomer, you have to spend a lot of time and effort accounting for the absorptions and emissions in your own planet's atmosphere. Uh, or otherwise, uh, maybe you cut to the chase, build a space telescope, and so you don't have to worry about your planet's own atmosphere. But whatever you do, uh, you devise a way to collect light uh, emitted by that faraway star. And so I'm sure that uh, in previous Greenway talks and other public talks at Palomar, uh, other people have talked about this process of characterizing the light from other stars. Um, so we know that light from other stars, just like light from our sun, uh, it's not like light from a laser. Um, it has a lot of different colors or energy levels or wavelengths. All these things are uh, interchangeable terms for the astronomer. So astronomers measure the intensity or the amount of light of these different colors coming from the star, which amounts to a spectrum, like the one I've drawn here with these sort of uh, cartoon axes for wavelength and intensity or magnitude. So some of these colors we might be able to uh, see with our own eyes. Some of them are too high or low energy for that. So we use the detectors hooked up to the telescope uh, to collect this spectrum. And then we keep collecting the spectrum over time. We don't just take one snapshot of it. We, we keep going back and looking at that same star. And so if the angle is right and the distance allows for it, uh, you might be able to see the spectrum change over time. And this change is because the light of the star is interacting with the molecules in the atmosphere of the worlds around it, or even, or even at the surface of the, those worlds. So you can see that periodically, intensity of light of certain colors will go up or down as the planet passes in front of the star, behind the star, near the edge or the limb of the star. And in some cases, the planet itself might be bright enough, emitting its own light or reflecting some of the light from the star, uh, or, uh, or rather diffracting it, um, such that you can observe the planet spectrum directly. So these periodic changes to the spectrum of the star, to the intensity of these different colors of light can be interpreted because we know that certain molecules interact with light of a certain color. Uh, so when we see the intensity of the particular color changing, then we can say, aha, this planet must have these specific molecules in its atmosphere. So sometimes, of course, it's easier to do this when the star itself is smaller and dimmer uh, compared to the planet, because then you can see that the changes, uh, the changes that the planet's atmospheric composition 
create in the observed spectrum a little bit more clearly. But of course, we've now established that life is pretty complicated. There, there's more to the definition of life than just molecules floating around in some sort of ether. Uh, it matters exactly what molecules we're looking for. And so, like I described on Earth, there are some molecules in our atmosphere that should not be observed together at the same time unless you have certain processes occurring at the surface to be constantly replenishing them. Uh, and those processes uh, would be difficult to achieve without the perpetuated disequilibria um, provided by living things. However, uh, astronomer, an astronomer looking at a distant, distant world can't be sure that the spectra they're collecting are actually showing them evidence of life until they eliminate all of the other possible abiotic or non-living explanations for the presence or absence of certain molecules. So on Earth, it's a lot easier to observe uh, the, uh, the origins of certain, what you might call molecular biosignatures in the planet's atmosphere. But on another planet, uh, you have to you have to rule everything else out. We sort of assume it doesn't have life on it unless, uh, unless we can prove that all of these other explanations are invalid. But even if you do rule all those things out, even if the astronomer is pretty sure that this signature has to be caused by life, well, that's interesting but we want to know more. We want to know more about that life because just uh, we don't just wanna know that life is there. We wanna know what it's like, how similar, how different is it from, our, from the life that we know here? Uh, what does it look like? What does it smell like? What is it doing? How is it shaping and changing the planet that it lives on or being changed by the planet in turn? So for that, we have to use the tools of geochemistry, geology, geobiology, biochemistry, all of these other, all of these other things. So this is where my work comes in. Uh, this is where the work of not observational astronomers, but observational geologists comes in. So our approach is to study where those signature molecules that you might see in uh, another planet's atmosphere, we want to understand where they came from, how they were produced and how they, different elements, different molecules are cycled through Earth's various organic and inorganic systems. So this diagram is one familiar to many biogeochemists. Uh, if you look at any of the many articles about uh, past environments on Earth, you'll probably see some version of this sort of box model or aquarium model of the world. So land, bodies of water, atmosphere, weather systems, temperature gradient through Earth's crust, all of these are part of this little sort of aquarium or terrarium model. So you might imagine for a moment how an element, for example, sulfur, might travel between these different environments, how it might be cycled. Some rocks have sulfur in them, which when heated in the Earth's interior, may be released from volcanoes and vents and one form or another entering the atmosphere, that sulfur may, interact with other elements while it's in the atmosphere. Maybe it takes a different form. It may remain airborne or it may rain out over the land and over the oceans. It may re-enter the sediment, the dirt, flow down a river towards other lakes and oceans, participating in different kinds of chemical reactions on its way and being incorporated into different structures, some of them living and some of them non-living. Some of it may sink as sediment and accumulate and be buried deeper and deeper until it becomes incorporated into uh, the rock once again and the cycle continues. So every step of this cycling, every process, every transition helps determine the amount of sulfur and the form that it takes when it's in one reservoir or another. So geologists, chemists, biologists, and every combination thereof, they're interested in the size and nature of each reservoir, but also what processes occur within them and in the transitions between them. And so because it's all connected, you can expect changes in one part of the cycle to affect changes in other parts of the cycle in some way, whether biology is involved or not. And so this is one of the major ways in which biogeochemists search for and try to characterize life is by measuring some of the properties, specifically the chemical and the isotopic composition of different reservoirs, such as repre those represented in these models, uh, and of the materials involved in the various processes and transitions within and between those reservoirs. So 
as you can imagine, this starts to get kind of confusing. So often scientists will simplify it. Well, we'll simplify our picture of the world and all of its biogeochemical cycles. And we put the world into so many boxes, an atmosphere box, an ocean box, a sedimentary pore fluids box. And we illustrate them like so. So boxes with, <clears throat> excuse me, arrows moving between them that represent the flux of a given material, typically a stable element like carbon or nitrogen or something between those boxes. For example, uh, these arrows might represent the amount of sulfur that is, uh, the a certain amount of sulfur moving through a system. So uh, I don't know if you can see my cursor exactly. Um, I'll try to use this little annotation tool. That's fun. Ooh, we can do all sorts of shapes. Wonderful. So uh, this arrow might represent the amount of sulfur that is partially dissolved in rainwater, uh, such as uh, HS minus or H2S. So that's hydrogen sulfide. Um, some amount of that sulfur enters the ocean, some amount of that sulfur enters uh, sediments, either on the land or at the ocean floor. Uh, there's some amount of exchange of sulfur, um, possibly in that hydrogen sulfide form, but also a sulfate, elemental sulfur, organically bound sulfur, and so on. Uh, and some of the sulfur may get buried by successive generations of more sediment piling on top, the creation of these sedimentary layers, uh, getting deeper and deeper into the crust. Let me, uh, ah, this is why we don't use the annotation tool. There we go. All right, so all of these different processes that represent the, the cycling between these various boxes, all of those processes uh, thus far, all the processes we talked about thus far are all inorganic. But we can also add some boxes for living organisms in the ocean and sediments. We can treat living things uh, as their own sort of reservoir of different for different elements or different isotopes and things like that. So those organisms, as they consume, excrete, metabolize, to continue with the example, that sulfur uh, in different forms according to their different metabolic strategies, uh, they are representing at any given moment, a certain amount of sulfur themselves. So not only are there, so even though there are different kinds of molecules uh, containing sulfur in different positions, uh, they're all, that sulfur is still the same. It's got the same number of protons. Uh, and though it may vary in its bonding environment and uh, the, its heaviness, its lightness, uh, it's all sulfur. And so without getting too much into the weeds here, uh, we can expect sulfur to behave in a certain way, to form certain bonds. And we expect that bonds between heavy sulfur, light sulfur, uh, we can expect that those are going to have slightly different energies associated with them. So generally speaking, generally speaking across the board, the heavier, uh, the slightly heavier, uh, the slightly more neutrons that uh, an atom of sulfur, or any other uh, any other element has, that's going to contribute a little bit to the stability of its bond. So it's easier to break bonds with between uh, lighter, less heavy versions of an at of one atom or another. So that means there's a little bit of a preference uh, in certain processes for which isotopes, which atoms of different masses uh, of that those uh, reactions are actually using. So if, for instance, uh, the arrows passing up from the ocean and sediment reservoirs toward the atmosphere might represent processes that select for lighter isotopes of sulfur, so these less heavy uh, atoms of sulfur, or rather molecules containing these less heavy atoms of sulfur, uh, then that means that the sulfur remaining in the ocean and sediment reservoirs is going to be a little bit heavier than the sulfur in the atmosphere. 
Uh, and so when you know how big each of those arrows are, how much sulfur is undergoing these sort of mass dependent processes, then you can try to figure out how heavy or how light each reservoir should be. Or, and this, this is what's important to the search for life. You can measure how heavy or light different reservoirs are or were in the past. And from those figures, you can work out what size, what the magnitude of the arrows or what kinds of pro and what kinds of processes they represented, uh, what was actually occurring. So for example, you might think of bacterial sulfate reduction that's happening all the time. It's the cause of stinky pond water uh, in public parks and backyards everywhere. Uh, bacterial sulfate reduction uh, has a certain preference for a measurable preference for slightly lighter uh, molecules of sulfate uh, than otherwise. So all of the reservoirs of sulfur uh, containing molecules downstream from the bacterial sulfate reduction process uh, are all going to be a little bit lighter than they would have been otherwise. So the heaviness or lightness of the sulfur or whatever uh, whatever element we're particularly interested in, uh, often scientists will express that heaviness or lightness using this little lowercase delta symbol. And so in the interest of time, I won't go into exactly, uh, exactly uh, what that means, but basically uh, it just allows us to talk in terms of nice round numbers without having to have quite so many, uh, quite so many decimal points. Uh, decimal points to deal with uh, when we're making our plots. But essentially, you can assign a heaviness or a lightness uh, of to each reservoir, both the biological and the abiological, uh, the living and the non-living parts of these systems. And if you can measure uh, if you can measure that heaviness or lightness, then you can between of different reservoirs, then you can kind of back calculate, uh, you may be able to back calculate the one from the other, provided you understand something about uh, the preference for the reactions represented by these different arrows for light or heavy uh, versions of those elements. So, and we'll represent that sort of selectiveness, that preference for lightness uh, or heaviness uh, by these little epsilon uh, epsilon signals. So in the modern, it's possible to measure all of those little epsilons and all of those little deltas um, in all of these reservoirs. But of course, in the ancient, uh, on ancient Earth and on other worlds, um, such as an exoplanet orbiting around a, diff uh, a different star, um, or say the surface of Mars, you might not be able to measure these values for all of these reservoirs. You have an incomplete picture of those cycles. But if you can measure a few of them and take what you know about the biological and abiological processes on our own planet, uh, the range of different uh, viable types of metabolisms, then you can you can fill in some of the blanks to reconstruct a more complete picture of biogeochemical cycling and the role of living things in biogeochemical cycling on that other world. So even if you can't measure every single thing at the same time, you can take uh, you can take what you know about living things and their interactions with the world on earth and apply it. So obviously all of this is a huge oversimplification. Clearly there are many more reservoirs than these uh, few simple ones that we've talked about thus far. And rather than the dozen or so arrows I've put here, there are thousands and thousands of arrows, but you can tease them apart through a combination of direct measurement, modeling, laboratory experiments. Uh, a biogeochemist can use the elemental and molecular composition the isotopic composition and knowledge of how biological or living processes differ from abiological or non-living processes to figure out whether or not life was happening at a particular time and place. And 
what is more, what that life was doing, what substances it was living on, uh, and how it was responding to changes in its environment. Of course, this isn't foolproof, and just like astronomers have to rule out all the possible non-living explanations for the presence of methane or ozone and such in the atmosphere of a potentially habitable planet, a biogeochemist has to tease apart all of the non-living and living and sort of living explanations for the properties of these different reservoirs. We have to rule things out. We have to figure out uh, in what way uh, the signals are being sort of mixed or blended together. So it's messy. It's not always definitive. And it's hard to measure the isotopic composition of a, uh, a piece of pyrite. Uh, in a billion year old rock and be sure that the isotopic composition of that pyrite is what it is because the sulfur in that pyrite was derived from the sulfur that used to be part of, for example, a sulfate reducing bacterium, which is depicted here as a little green bean, which in reality would maybe only be a few micrometers across. So whatever element uh, you're tracing, uh, and your tracing and its passage through uh, a living system, it's, we know that it's being metabolized in a certain way. It's going through certain reactions. Uh, there are many, but at the same time, there are also many, many other elements also going through their own cycles, going through their own reactions. So you can measure uh, multiple systems at the same time. Uh, to develop ever more complex pictures of uh, what might have been going on uh, in the interplay between living and non-living systems. So I believe that, let's see, so let me look at the amount of time we have left. Okay, excellent. So we can keep going here. So this brings us to the million dollar question. We've, we've now defined life. We've talked about some of the tools uh, of, uh, that we use to describe life, the things that we talk about life doing, its metabolism, its, uh, its homeostasis, that's the characterization of all these different uh, reactions that we put together inside of a living organism. But, but how do we detect it? Uh, what, what, do our samples actually look like? And how do we actually make these measurements of those little deltas and little epsilons that I was talking about? So really, it's difficult to prove when you're looking at another, uh, another planet or say ancient, ancient rock on Earth. Uh, which is itself this representation of another planet, ancient Earth. It's difficult to say that all of this chemistry that I've done, all of these, uh, all of these deltas, all of these epsilons, that like it's it's difficult to say definitively, like yes, this this is evidence of life, and not evidence of some combination of abiotic pro of abiotic processes um, that were enabled by some unusual injection of, ener of energy into the system. Uh, really, if you, if you want to be really, really sure that life was there, you'd want to have some sort of physical evidence, something that you could, that you could see, something that you could touch. Uh, and generally that's a fossil. I love fossils very much. Fossils are a lot of kids, a lot of our first introduction uh, into the study of uh, into the study of life on other wor worlds. But while fossils are great at telling us about past life and the processes uh, and the processes used by that past life to to survive in this or that environment, fossils are really difficult to find and really difficult to interpret because uh, it's it's difficult to become a fossil in the first place. So one of the things that I get asked um, as an astrobiologist who works with people on missions of planetary exploration is, well, like, have you seen any, like, do we, do you see, let me rephrase that. I get asked, what would what would you want to see as an astrobiologist that would convince you 
that life was there. Uh, and you say, and obviously the answer is a fossil, but to become a fossil, the living thing that you're talking about, the little sulfate reducing bacterium or that little soft worm, it has to, it has to make it from the environment it was living in. It has to make it from its life, uh, from its life through its death uh, into an environment that's conducive to its preservation. So this, now we're not even necessarily talking about looking for signals of, of processes going on while it was alive, but now we have to worry about the processes that were occurring after death. So to become a fossil, a little sulfate reducing bacterium has to make it uh, from the water down to lake bottom or a seafloor without being consumed and recycled by other voracious microorganisms and other animals on its way. I think that uh, I once used the example to someone of a, uh, say, a hot dog, little end of a hot dog or a corn dog dropped on the ground at the end of a fair. So that hot dog or corn dog, if perfectly preserved, might tell about uh, the people who were there before, the animals that they, that the animals and the the crops that they cultivated, the kinds of metabolisms that they performed. Uh, it might tell this really elaborate story and paint this picture of uh, a world that is no longer there, but it can't tell that story and probably won't tell that story millions of years down the line because that half a hot dog or that little nub of corn dog sitting on the ground is going to get uh, picked apart by animals. It's going to get it's going to go through decay processes. It's going to get rained on. It's going to get stomped on. It's going to get covered by maybe layers of, of dirt and silt and uh, eventually turn from a little nub of corn dog into just a diffuse carogenic organic sludge. Uh, and a lot of those details might be lost. But I think that it might help to illustrate a little bit that it might it might uh, it might sound a little bit bleak. The chances for preserving fossil evidence of life uh, might seem very low, but sometimes it does happen. Sometimes those little bacteria, sometimes those little nubs of corn dog soft bodies, sometimes they survive. They're buried, they are lithified. That means become rock, crystallize. Uh, they leave behind, if not the actual body, uh, a shape reminiscent of the body that they had that can be later that can be later observed. And so ideally, if you're lucky if all of those things happen in the right order, if it's buried quickly enough, if it's lithified quickly enough and at a stage before it's completely degraded um, by the process of, of decay by other organisms, then you can get microbial fossils. And so this, this is just a, uh, a photograph uh, that I took a while back of a sample I have of a piece of chart from uh, the Gunflint Formation. This is in Southern Canada. Uh, this is in Thunder Bay, Ontario, actually. And you can see there's a scale bar uh, close to the middle of the screen that says 100 micrometers. So that's the 100 micrometer scale bar. And you can see all these little sort of latticework filaments sort of floating about. Those, those are microbial fossils. So We've talked a lot about how difficult it is to preserve evidence for life in the past, but it does it does happen. And when it and when it happens like this, it kind of reveals a wealth of information about the world. So all of those little all those little squiggly lines, all those little filaments and hairs, they're telling us that hundreds of millions of years ago we had a a microbial mat. So some sort of uh, you know, you can think of it as as palm as a pond sludge, something like that. All braided, all braided and tangled together, 
uh, living on an ancient seafloor. And if we measure the isotopic composition of the sort of sediments and grains, uh, and cement, uh, the crystals that cement them, and we measure the isotopic composition of the organic material, the remnants left behind inside of those little filaments, and we compare them, then we can see actually the, that they're different. So the differences in their isotopic and the differences in their isotopic composition in this sample are almost exactly the same as the differences in the isotopic composition with respect to carbon, with respect to oxygen, with respect to uh, with respect to sulfur that you that we see in the modern world between microorganisms and their and the surrounding sediment in modern oceans and modern lakes. So this would be the perfect definitive biosignature uh, if we were to find it on another world. Uh, and it's not exactly pretty. It's not a skull. It's not a, it's not a nice solid footprint. It's not a chunk of a cord dog or hot dog discarded from a fairground. It's just a bunch of wiggly lines inside of a rock. And I think I think that that's pretty remarkable. So I'm going to skip ahead a little bit here. Uh, this is sort of a zoomed out image uh, from that same rock. So even if you don't manage to preserve all of the filaments, you don't manage to, even if you don't manage to preserve uh, the original uh, organic matter uh, that was there, that was there and be able to measure its isotopic composition. Even if you don't have those things preserved, it's still possible for living things. There are still, there are physical processes uh, rather than uh, mass selective chemical processes that living things can perform. And one of those things, uh, especially with respect to microbial life is the sort of accumulation and trapping of small sediments in shapes and forms that would be unlikely if you didn't have those little filaments there. So what you can sort of see here are these sort of thin layers, these thin blobs sort of rising up toward the upper right of, upper right of the screen. Um, you would be hard pressed to, without the presence of sort of sticky, uh, sticky tangled microbial mats get loose sediments at the seafloor to group together and stick together into these little intricately layered columns. Uh, in fact, it probably wouldn't be possible. It would be unphysical. And so the presence of these little thin wiggly lines, these thin laminations, uh, these and these sort of finger-like mounds or towers that tells us even though, even if we don't have any of the organic material, even if we don't have any, uh, we're unable to measure all those deltas and epsilons like we talked about before, we know that there's a process going on that required living things and required living things in a very particular uh, sort of confirmation or form. So if we, as, I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit here, uh, not that far ahead. So if we, as astrobiologists, astrogeobiologists, were to pick up a rock on another world uh, and we're charged with the task of figuring out does this rock represent a time on this world where there were living things, then we would have to, we would probably take the approach of cutting it open, shaving it really, really thin so that we can put it under the microscope and, and look at light pass through it and reflect off of, and reflect off of it. We'd characterize its composition. We'd characterize all of the physical textures that we see in there. And we'd look for, We'd look for shapes. We'd look for forms. We'd look for evidence of. Uh, we'd look for evidence of sedimentation, uh, so the deposition of sediments, uh, 
in patterns that wouldn't be possible unless you had a biological form like a mat or uh, a, lace, a lattice work of filaments. Uh, we'd look even closer and we'd try to find, uh, we'd look closer and we'd try to look for some of these microfossils, which are very rare, but might still, but might still appear. We'd look for certain mineralogical compositions. We'd look for certain chemical and isotopic compositions um, of both the inorganic and organic components of the rock to try to figure out if there's a difference between them. Because if there's a difference between them, then that might speak to some sort of process that reflects the, the separation of the living from the separation from the living of the non-living, the passage of different elements through uh, living and non-living reservoirs. And we use that to, and we use that to sort of reconstruct, uh, reconstruct any a picture of the ecology, a picture of the environment uh, that that rock represented. And so, effectively, you do all of the exact same things uh, for that rock on another world as you would do for a rock on this world that represents ancient life. So I'm going to skip a little bit ahead here because I know we are effectively out of time. The only other thing that I was going to talk to y'all about today was uh, the sort of timeline for life on the earth. Because um, I, in the course of my work, I spend a lot of time talking about thinking about uh, microorganisms and their impact on the and their impact on the non living components of their environment and vice versa. And sometimes I'm asked the question, well, why are we talking about microorganisms? Why aren't we talking about? Uh, why aren't we talking about? Uh, dinosaurs? Why aren't we talking about birds? Why aren't we talking about mammals? Why aren't we talking about human beings and that sort of evidence? And I'll, uh, I'll skip through this and we can come back to it and questions if people are curious, but basically this is just a little timeline of life that I like to show people uh, that really demonstrates spatially how much of the history of life on earth is really dominated by microorganisms and therefore the uh, incredible importance of studying the physical impact, the physical and chemical uh, and isotopic impacts of living things on uh, the different components of uh, Earth's environment. So this whole green box represents the history of microbial life on Earth compared to the before in the yellow where we didn't have life yet and the bright green on the right where we have multicellular and animal life. So ultimately, I'll leave you here with this thought that the geobiologist, uh, the geobiologist armed with their rock hammer and, uh, and notebooks and uh, spectrom mass spectrometers and uh, mass spectrometers and uh, their uh, ion beams would, their search for life looks very much like the search for life on ancient earth, looking for patterns in the chemical isotopic composition and in the physical form of the rocks, rocks that make up the world that they're studying, looking for patterns that can't be explained by non-living processes alone, looking for patterns that require the influence of life as we have worked to define it. Uh, so with that, I'll just leave up this slide that has my personal website, which has a tool on it. If there's any questions that you think of later down the line that you'd like to ask or things that I've mentioned that, uh, that you would like to hear elaborated on, I'm happy to talk about those now. I'm happy to answer questions about that later because uh, cramming life, the history of life, the universe and everything into uh, 45 to an hour minute to an hour long talk is uh, always, always leaves, you always have to leave something out, oversimplify other things. So I'm happy to 
happy to answer any questions about that now or later. All right, I'll go ahead and stop there. Uh, go ahead and stop sharing and we can, yeah, open things up for questions. There aren't so many of us. So uh, I think that uh, people can use the chat if they want, but we can also just talk. Cecilia, thank you very much. Greatly appreciate it. That was wonderful. And I'd like to start off with a question that I'm real curious about, if I may. I don't, you know, I don't wish you do that, but um, your discussion of microfossils raised, raised a memory of something a long time ago. Um, there was a meteorite found in Antarctica and um, they cut it apart and they found what some people thought were structures created in that meteorite by biological activity on Mars. This was years ago, but do you know what the status of that controversy is and what your opinion of um, what the findings were? Yeah, so I assume you're talking about the uh, Allen Hills, uh, Allen Hills meteorite. Yes. Uh, the, uh, for those who, I wish I had a, some of those photographs to pull up and to share here, but uh, I'm sure y'all can all Google in another tab, one of the benefits of uh, these virtual talks. But so inside of the Allen Hills meteorite were these uh, little structures that looked something like, that reminded us a lot as a scientific community of worms or, uh, or maybe even septated filaments. Uh, so uh, they, septated filaments, just meaning filaments made up of, uh, filaments or threads that seem to be made up of sort of a string of pearls uh, where each pearl is an individual cell uh, in the process of uh, dividing and growing. So the general scientific consensus of the Allen Hills meteorites is that the structures uh, within them that looked kind of like promising fossils um, were neither the right size, um, nor had, uh, nor were they ubiquitous within that sample uh, to be consistent with an interpretation of life. So elaborating on that a little bit, uh, individual cells, there are certain, there are certain physical limits um, to the size of an individual uh, the size of an individual cell. They can't be too small, they can't be too big, or you start to have difficulties with uh, the exchange of essential, uh, of life essential molecules across the surfaces. So the, my understanding is that the size of the individual cells uh, wouldn't have been, uh, would have been un unphysical. Uh, as we understand, as we understand, uh, as we understand cells now, the the other main problem, though, is the the sort of rarity of these forms, even within that meteorite. So, generally speaking, um, if you have a if you have a sample that small, a rock that small, um, then you can generally expect all the components of that rock to have sort of been through the same evolutionary history. Uh, so there's no reason why a pocket of it, that one maybe cubic centimeter, uh, should be should have a significantly different, uh, what you might call a diagenetic history. So diagenetic just meaning the history of formation and alteration uh, than the adjacent uh, cubic centimeter. So if you see uh, if you see something that looks like a microfossil in one cubic centimeter of the rock, you should expect to see the same processes that allowed that microfossil to form should have been occurring throughout that small sample of rock. So if you see something that kind of looks like the shape of a cell, which is to say sort of either a blob, either a blob or a filament, cells are pretty simple uh, in, their, in 
uh, their morphologies, then you'd expect to see a lot of those filaments or a lot of those blobs of the same size, uh, the same sort of uh, aspect, ratio, aspect ratios um, distributed throughout it. And so if you can only find uh, one or two blobs uh, that sort of look like a cell inside of a, inside of a sample like that, then it should sort of call into questions like, mm, well, what happened that only this, uh, this scrap of the rock uh, and not all of these other parts of the rock uh, preserved, this, preserved this fossil. Um, so that, those are sort of the, uh, the main objections to the interpretation as a uh, microbial fossil. But there are other objections as well since the, uh, the forms, the sort of septated filament looking things inside of it are not, uh, they're not so distinctive as uh, the forms of living things that they can't have other explanations. So uh, I talk about how microorganisms sort of take the shape, sort of look like blobs or filaments, but uh, it's possible to make uh, it's possible to make filament like uh, single crystals or bundles of crystals. Um, and it's possible to make um, sort of blob shaped or botryoidal uh, crystal forms as well. Um, and then it's possible to say, dissolve them and fill them with a, with a mineral, dissolve the, uh, the original crystal um, or replace it with a crystal of a different composition, a different level of crystallinity, a different grain size and things like that. So as you're replacing, uh, so you can, you can explain the shape, if you can explain the shapes and conformations uh, in a sample like the Allen Hills meteorite more easily with a history of crystal, crystal growth and replacement, uh, then generally the astrobiological community is uh, not uh, is not inclined to think that the biological that a biological explanation is needed. So, generally speaking, because of the the difficulty in making and forming microfossils and having them survive billions and millions of years of Earth history and alteration. Uh, microfossils found in a meteorite that has not only been through uh, the processes that formed the rock, but also the process of uh, hurtling through the space environment and then crashing through uh, a thick atmosphere like the Earth's. Um, it seems that that would be one of the worst possible, uh, that would be one of the worst possible ways to preserve evidence of, of microbial fossils. So it's, uh, so the, the, the geologic setting, I guess I'm saying, the geologic setting also matters a lot. So a meteorite is perhaps less favorable than a, uh, a bed of nice finely laminated shale that's been quietly sitting in the middle of a, uh, a stable craton, a stable continent for millions of years. Uh, so sorry, that's not a long answer to a short question, but uh, to summarize, the, uh, so the Allen Hills meteorites, uh, the cell-like shapes within the Allen Hills meteorite were sort of, uh, have been the, the prevailing, discredited. yes, discredited. discredited, that's, I like that. I was trying to look for a, a diplomatic, a, nice a diplomatic word, but <laughs> mostly discredited because of their shape, their, uh, their rarity, even like within that one sample, um, the existence of other explanations for the uh, formation and alteration history of those forms, uh, and then the geologic setting that they occupy um, being unlikely uh, to preserve evidence of life as we understand it. Well, but, thank you very much for that. That was, that was quite an answer. I appreciate that. <laughs> like to see if somebody else has other questions. 
I'd, I'd like to ask one. This was a very interesting talk because up to now, I'd always assumed we could make some sort of a spectrographic chemical detection that gave evidence for life. I mean, short of some intelligent RF communications or a visitation. Uh, but what you're really suggesting is, and I understand the timeline problems with those things, uh, our best shot at finding evidence of life is going to be through a lander on another planet that can take geological samples rather than all these other techniques. Yeah, I I agree with that. I think that uh, while we can observe, and I'm sure I'm sure there's got to have been uh, talks uh, through Palomar or other observatories before about uh, the difficult work of detecting biosignatures on exoplanets um, using the techniques of observational astronomy. Uh, it's, you know, a lot of the time when astronomers talk about finding life that way, they're talking about, can we detect, uh, can we detect methane? Can we detect water? Can we detect oxygen? And it's, you know, any of those things on its own is not enough to not enough to say, yes, definitively, this is evidence of life. Uh, you can, uh, methane is extremely reactive, very easily uh, oxidized to carbon dioxide. So if you see a lot of methane and you see a lot of oxygen in the atmosphere at the same time, then, uh, then that might be fairly strong evidence, but you'd still have to, you'd still have to rule out uh, uh, volcanism or maybe uh, some sort of episodic outgassing of outgassing event as the planet warms and you melt the melt and release methane class rates from the from the poles there you, you'd have to rule out all these other explanations and with just observational astronomy you wouldn't really have uh, you wouldn't really have all the lines of data that you need to do that so um, actually visiting a planetary surface um, looking at the rocks, um, being able to sniff the air, kiss the dirt, like put samples of it through your mass spectrometer to measure its isotopic composition, uh, to shine different lights at it and make sure and see how the component, uh, how its component parts interact with those things and figure out its composition. Like you need, you need that, uh, you need that microanalysis in its geologic context uh, in order to tease apart the biotic from the abiotic. So I think that uh, our best bet for finding uh, physical evidence of life in the universe is probably our, our surface missions to Mars and Europa um, and uh, probably Enceladus, maybe Titan. I'd love to go back to Titan. That would be really cool. But yeah, these uh, sort of surface in situ missions. Thank you. Thank you for that. Other questions? Oh, come on. Oh, come on. Well, then I'll ask another one and maybe we'll conclude with this one since we are almost an hour and a half in. Um, why, why do you think, opinion question, why? Why are we so interested in finding extraterrestrial life? And what will change here on Earth when and if we find it? Uh, I love this question because uh, I think why, why do we care about this is, you know, I think the most important question in science, uh, especially fields of science that don't you know, directly influence our quality, our material quality of life. And so I think that, I think that we care about life because we're, as humans, we're like, we're like a little piece of the universe that's able to look at itself uh, and wonder about itself. Um, and I think that understanding who we are and where we came from is this is it's a very deeply human thing that everybody regardless of their 
you know, regardless of their position in time and space, where they live in the world, the time period that they lived in, everyone has wondered at some points, like, how, huh, like, why am I here? And why am I the way that I am? And so I think these questions about, are we alone? What is like, what might like look, look like that? What might life look like elsewhere in the universe? Uh, I think that those things are, those things are the, the, that's like naturally the place that we go to when we're wondering about ourselves. You know, we want to understand like, are we, why are we unique? Um, and I think that, you know, understanding the physical, uh, the physical underpinnings of the universe um, can also be very captivating, but it, it doesn't, I think, connect people to themselves uh as much you know we we want to know we want to know about ourselves you know and so uh why do we study the atom because ultimately atoms are a part of us they're a part of the world that we occupy and experience and we we need we need to understand that so i think there's i think there's this push to like search for life in the universe just because of that sort of deeply captivating um interest in the self and the origins of the self and the future of the self uh, that I think all humans share. So it's, it's something that is compelling both to the, the writers and the receivers of research grants and also the general public. Uh, the answer to the question, what do we think, what do I think the, would happen when we discover life elsewhere uh, in the universe? Um, I like to believe that something like uh, that something like Gene Roddenberry's vision of Star Trek would happen where, oh my gosh, like there's life elsewhere, all that all humans would come together and, uh, you know, to try to explore the stars and present a united front to uh, other intelligences of the universe. But I think, I think that's unlikely. I think that's probably unlikely. Uh, what I think would happen is it would I think that it would give some sort of satisfaction or peace of mind to like that sort of nagging curiosity that all humans have about like, are we alone? Are we unique? Why are we the way that we are? I think that it would speak to that. And so even if it wouldn't, you know, it wouldn't solve or disappear all of the problems, all of the problems and differences that we have among ourselves on our own planet. But I think it would, I do think it would unite us a little bit. Uh, I think that, you know, the initial discovery would probably be very, the news cycle would probably, it would probably run through the news cycle in a few, uh, in a few weeks and then maybe disappear and be replaced by, uh, and be replaced by the next thing. But I think that knowing that there's something else, that there's something else out there uh, and that we have something in common with it. I think it would change how, I think it would change all of science because we, there's so much that we, uh, that we sort of speculate about. We think we understand, we think we understand a lot of things, but the one thing that we don't understand is why or how we're even capable of seeking understanding. You know, so I think that it's, it's a central, uh, is one of the pillars of scientific inquiry is answering the answering these questions. And so, you know, if you could find something else kind of like us elsewhere in the universe and, you know, say, oh, we, we understand why this, we understand why this is here. We understand the conditions that had to come together in order to enable this thing to happen. I, I think that that would, I think that that would change how people see themselves and their place in the world. But, but yeah. Also, I think that like many other fields of pure science, along the way, we discover a lot of other things that do have, you know, a sort of direct material impact on how we approach, uh, on how we approach our lives. So, you know, even if in the process of searching for life on another world, we don't, uh, 
we don't necessarily find evidence of that life. We might find evidence that, you know, explains the climate history of uh, a planet like Mars or like Venus and gives us a better understanding of how our own planet's climate will evolve and how we should prepare, how we should prepare for it and things like that. So I think that there are, uh, you know, there are reasons beyond the philosophical to, to study the origins of life. But I think the philosophical reasons, those are the, the main reason why we care. Well, I, have a, I have a criticism of this kind of search for life when mm -hmm. we are looking for things that are, I don't know if this is the right word, biotic, things that are somewhat like ourselves. Doesn't that limit us terribly? Maybe there are things that we could be looking for patterns that we might see that might indicate some kind of life that's quite different from what has evolved here in our little speck of the universe. Absolutely, yeah. I think that, uh, so that's sort of what I wanted to do with uh, walking through the actual definition of life, you know, because when we say life different from our, life different from how we know it to be, uh, well, it still has to look like life somehow. And so we have to have some way of defining, well, what is life? What are those things? So we're not necessarily, I don't think that any scientist expects that we'll find a form of life that elsewhere in the universe that looks like, sounds like, talks like, metabolizes like us as in humans, um, or even us as in any of the multicellular organisms on our own planet, because we know that those things have been so shaped by their unique, uh, uh, by their unique uh, environment specific to this world. But I think that microorganisms, the, uh, the concept of the cell, the concept of the uh, some, uh, some inter some space separated from its environment and able to respond to and interact respond to and interact with it but not completely meld into and fuse with it i think that that is kind of an essential part of our definition of life and so when we find life elsewhere in the universe it's like that i think that's the most similarity that we can expect to have with it uh is that is that sort of list of requirements? Like, are we performing homeostasis? Are we, uh, do we have this diversity and complexity of forms that allow us to perform those reactions essential to homeostasis? Like those things I think are essential to our definition of life. Um, beyond that, totally agree with you. There's, you know, there's no reason to think anything we find is gonna look or seem anything like what we have here, but we, but I think that, you know, the idea of a cell or the idea of a, uh, uh, even if it doesn't, isn't exactly the same size or shape or uh, uses exactly the same biomolecules that we see cells having here. I think that, you know, analog looking for structures analogous to that, even if they're made out of different things, I, I think that that's still, you know, that would still be valid as life, even though it would look nothing like what we have here. So yeah, definitely the search for life, totally agree, should not be limited to uh, you know, a search for spacefaring civilizations, or a search for uh, a search for trilobites, or a search for little green men. But you know, I'm I'm comfortable. Like personally, I think the the as the field of astrobiology stands, are comfortable with you know a search for something that fulfills that uh, that short brief of performing homeostasis, maintaining chemical, maintaining a chemical disequilibrium and like trying to perpetuate that and working to perpetuate that disequilibrium. Uh, I think that's, that's about as, you know, broad a definition of life as I think we could, uh, a broad definition of life as we can have without not having a definition of, at all. Uh, but yeah, which of course, you know, that's why I love science fiction too. All of the, uh, all of the other forms of life that people have dreamed up, uh, have dreamed up that we might recognize as life, even though it looks and sounds and acts nothing like us. Uh, I think that's a good place for uh, astrobiologists and geobiologists to look. 
I think it, when I've heard a number of talks about exobiology, and whenever I hear them, I'm reminded, I think it's Hamlet that says, there are more things in heaven and earth than are known in your philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> I think when we do find some kind of life, um, it's going to be something very strange and very different, something that today we don't know about in our philosophy. But I guess you have to start somewhere, and mm -hmm. you're starting with uh, what we kind of know about life is, you know, you're starting with what we know, I guess. Yeah. That's a good place to start. Yeah. You can start with a start with a cell, and then after that, I just yes, all bets off. <laughs> the the geobiology you talk about works very well in the solar system, but unfortunately, if we're talking about the search for life in the whole universe, uh, we're unlikely to go to any of the other exoplanets anytime soon with a, a rock and hammer. <laughs> but we can, of course, as you talked about do spectroscopy on their atmospheres and aside from just talking about you know the usual water oxygen etc cetera, etc cetera, can you think of a network of chemical reactions where if you looked at a whole bunch of things we look at this 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 simultaneously okay this doesn't really work too well in a regular equilibrium atmosphere but if you put living critters on the surface and process things then you can do it uh, it won't give you 100%, but it'll give you reason to think maybe they're more likely than here. Does, can you think of any other chemicals that you could do that kind of thing with? Yeah, yeah. So this is actually, so this is something that I actually worked on uh, as a, so as an undergraduate, my undergraduate thesis, um, I was specifically trying to model what would the atmosphere of an inhabited planet look like uh, sort of printed on top of the, uh, the spectrum of, I was specifically interested in like small red M types, M type stars. Uh, and so there's a very, a very, uh, I would say, exuberant uh, field of research, uh, group of researchers um, who try to build uh, more inclusive uh, models of habitability, um, of habitability in this way. So we imagine here's a planet, here these metabolic processes happening at the surface, these uh, sort of simplified biogeochemical cycles going on. Here's the sort of snapshot of the atmosphere that we would expect. Like, let's, and then we also have a model of the spectrum of the star as we would receive it. Put those together. Can we disentangle them again, remove the spectrum of the star and look at the signal um, for this habitable planet with these processes happening on. So there's a lot of people who are working on who are working on that actively now. And so the sort of so there is a chemical signature for an inhabited world that is more complex, uh, involves more uh, diversity of uh, more molecular diversity than uh, than just oxygen and oxygen and and methane essentially, but uh, unfortunately uh, in a lot of these in a lot of these models, uh, what we find is that those more those more complicated uh, those more complicated organic molecules and those disequilibria, they we often just don't have enough photons to resolve them, you know, enough photons in that region of the spectrum where their characteristic absorptions and uh, absorptions and emissions might happen. Uh, so I think that the reason to like focus on water, the reason to focus on methane, the reason to focus on nitrogen and like some of these things is because they're, they're a lot, they're a lot easier to observe. Uh, there's more photons in that part of the spectrum where they're active. Uh, so it's easier to disentangle the signal from the noise in those parts of the spectrum. Uh, but 
but yeah, like our, our atmosphere, for example, you know, for a while it, so the presence of the presence of oxygen, the presence of ozone, like those things are very much tied to microbial activity, like on our, on our planet surface. And though we know that there are ways that you can get them um, purely just with you know, thermochemistry, uh, the atmosphere of another planet, uh, we still can, they're pretty powerful biosignatures for our own planet. So I think that, uh, you know, there is merit still in looking for these, like sim those more simple biosignatures. But I think that we're, we're sort of out of luck when it comes to some of these more complicated molecules. Uh, that's why being able to measure isotopic compositions across like interstellar different distances, I think could be really powerful because it's, uh, you know, that's the main tool of, you know, the geobiologists when you have an ancient rock that has a uh, very little in the way of original organic material and you don't really have any of those like essential molecules of life left inside of the rock but what you do have is the uh the slight heaviness the slight lightness of one uh uh one mineral type or another um that speaks to uh biological processes uh, that were happening at the time of their formation so if you could do something like that for say the sulfur chemi like the the uh, sulfur bearing uh, molecules in an exoplanet atmosphere, uh, measure the isotopic composition of your hydrogen sulfide or your, uh, <sighs> I'm trying to think of some of the others that we get. I guess we do just get some uh, um, sulfur dioxide as well. Uh, in our own atmosphere that I think bears the signature. Like you could tease apart the, uh, you could tease apart the contribution of volcanism versus microbial sulfate reduction or microbial sulfide oxidation and these other metabolisms. You could probably tease those apart if you had some constraint on uh, what you would expect, uh, what you would expect the starting sulfur reservoir to look like. Um, of course, you'd only have that constraint on the starting sulfur reservoir of the planet if you uh, if you know something about planetary evolution, you know. So that's uh, you'd have to collaborate. You'd have to have your biogeochemist and your uh, your theorist who studies rocky planet formation and stellar evolution. You know, they all have to get together to figure out what your starting point is so that you can interpret your finishing point, but. But yeah, again, a long answer to a short question. I don't think that there are that, uh, I don't think that there are, we're likely to be able to uh, measure the abundance of some of these more complex organic molecules as they might occur in an exoplanet atmosphere, but we can, uh, but perhaps the addition of uh, isotopic measurements across distances might, uh, make some of our measure our, the abundances of these simpler molecules more informative. So are the next generation of telescopes that are starting to come online in the next few years, maybe the next decade, are, is that going to give you the tools, Cecilia, to do some of these kinds of, of studies to see this kind of detail? Yeah, so I think the main uh... The main benefit of a lot of the new telescopes that are coming out is just their ability to collect more signal, um, more light. You know, more light equals more data um, for observational astronomy. So, uh, and the ability to disentangle your signal from your noise. Um, so, and then of course, you know, a space telescope where you don't have to peer through Earth's atmosphere is uh, is even that much more powerful. So, I I do think I do believe that. Um, James Webb is probably going to be our best bet for reading the atmospheres, reading the fingerprint of the atmospheres of smaller rocky worlds um, close in uh, in a close orbit around their stars. I think that JWST could provide us with a good amount of signal in the right wave band um, to make some of those observations. Uh, but probably not sulfur isotope geochemistry. Uh, 
not really equipped for that. It's not really its primary directive. Um, but uh, I don't know. Really, I think there's, you know, it may not seem exotic and exciting because it's home, but our solar system is woefully underexplored. So I think that a lot of the, the surface mission to Europa um, that's coming, uh, the Europa Clipper uh, mission that's coming down the pipeline, I think that that is going to be really, really valuable. Um, and of course, sample return from Mars um, is going to be incredibly valuable. Because, um, you know, again, even if you don't even if you don't find evidence for life, what we do find evidence for is, uh, you know, alternative planetary histories, uh, other ways that planets can evolve and change uh, that may enable or preclude uh, the development of life. So I'm I'm pretty excited for pretty excited for those uh, solar system missions as well. Well, Cecilia, thank you. The, oh, I think David, John, David. Yeah, let's, uh, let's let's pick up David's question and we'll bring things to an end. Okay, David. Sounds good. It was mentioned that exobiology might be uh, different uh, from anything we've uh, known. What, in your opinion, is the strangest life form here on Earth? Oh my goodness. There's so many to choose from. Honestly, I like, I look over at my little dog. I have this, I have a little dog. She's like 12 pounds. I look over at her and I'm like, how, like, how did we selectively breed something that like wants, that wants to run and pick up a ball? Like just the compulsion to like run and pick up a ball to please another living organism. Like, regardless of whether or not it will turn into a material reward. Like, on, like her little brain baffles me, you know? Um, but, uh, but honestly, the strangest, like the thing that the, the absolute strangest thing though, I think, uh, I think the strangest things are probably just, uh, probably it's a boring answer, but probably just deep sea fish. You know, everything like in the deep in the deep ocean that's able able to handle incredibly high, incredibly high pressures and and just stifling darkness and uh, live off of you know just scraps of uh, scraps of chemical energy. Uh, those things those things are just baffle me. And then on top of that, to have this like incredibly like div diverse complexity of form for no other like no one's looking at them and yet they have these incredible pigments like there's nothing uh you know there's no reason for them to necessarily have like the most developed and complex eyes like visual receptors and yet they do so like i think deep sea is probably the place to go for the weirdest most alien things on, even on our own planet uh but yeah personally it's you know by the existence of the existence of little animals that are capable of learning and caring and things. I think that's the, the wackiest and most improbable thing that Earth has produced, honestly. I felt that way about my son a couple of times. <laughs> uh, Cecilia, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the presentation. And I think it's been a wonderful discussion. Thank you so much for having me. This is one of my favorite, you know, topics to wax philosophical about. So I, uh, it's good to get back to that ultimate motivation for uh, why did I decide to do this PhD in the first place? <laughs> it's a fascinating this topic. Is why. And with that, I think we need to come, come to a conclusion here. We're almost two hours into this. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Thank you for letting me uh, go over. Yeah. Oh, no, absolutely. And let me let me conclude with a few words about our next speaker. In two weeks, June 5th, Dr. Katie Bauman, Assistant Professor of Computing and Mathematical Sciences at Caltech, will give a talk titled Imaging the Unseen, taking the first picture of a black hole. So let me thank 
let me think. Kathy has disappeared. <clears throat> I was going to say, Kathy, I don't know if you know, she's been giving us live images of Palomar Observatory from up on High Point. Hmm. And I was going to, I'll have to write to her and thank her for that. I thought that was interesting. And thank you again, Cecilia Sanders, and thank you to everyone for attending today and for supporting the Greenway Talks online. With that, I'll close the meeting and I hope to see you all again in two weeks. Bye-bye.